How fabulous. Do you think I can hug him? Would that be weird? I think it might be a bit weird. I think I'll just high five him. Wish I could have met you, you old fool. I really do. I would have just gently sort of lain here and followed you around everywhere. And you would be going, get off! Just get off me! I'm eating my lunch, I'd be like, I don't care. Just like that. always obvious that Miranda Hart was destined for comedy stardom, but her desire to perform was never in doubt. Thanks. That gives you a taste. I always wanted to perform from the age of six. I do remember I performed the entire Annie to myself, but imagining I was performing it to an 1,000, 2,000 seater West End show. I can distinctly remember that. When we first did little plays, two people, it's so embarrassing thinking about it, inviting 20 people to come and sit in the sitting room. Yeah. And watch a little play, I mean, I just <laughs> cringe. <laughs> but also the confidence that we had, that we thought we were good enough, that we could actually open ourselves up to the public. <laughs> The scale of Miranda's plans grew and grew. Before long, her productions were being staged at the local village hall. Hello, village hall. <laughs> it's much higher than I remember. It's really high. It's like quite scarily high. It is, isn't it? The Double Tape Theatre Company presents Orange, Orange Island. Island. Did I sort of direct you? You were quite bossy. You very much oh, took the lead, yes. <laughs> you were very much director as well as actor. Two plants. Are you ready? Okay. Okay. Oh, hello, Marianne. All right. So, so. You're looking a bit under the weather to make use of a pun. Well, keep it firmly under your petals, but I've got a touch of the old green fly. Oh, nasty. Are you on the up, though? Well, I had a shot of pesticide, but my leaf sheaths, pistols, and oracles are still a bit tender. <laughs> 1996, which is. Old enough to know better, really. No, no, I think it's good. I no, think 24, I would have been. The Orange Island one, 1996, mm. sort of the famous two plants sketch. Mm -hmm. um, I think that was my beginning of I really do want to do this professionally. I think I was yeah. probably quite serious about it. You were. Joe, did you go to the uh, uh, our coffee morning when there was a slideshow on plumbing special specialising in bullcocks? No, I didn't. No. What a pity I missed that. How honest can I be? Very. Some of the sketches were not uh, <laughs> brilliant. I remember cut and sort of sitting there kind of going... <laughs> really? Like, sort of panicked laughter. Yeah. Definitely coming out thinking, you know, how, how long is she going to keep doing this for? You know, how, what, what Did point? you really Yes, think definitely. <laughs> what point do you think... This is news to me. That's hilarious. At what point do you think, OK, let's just throw in the towel? Good evening. I think we probably did at some point sit you down and say, how do you feel this is going? One word of advice. Be bold about your future. Oh, this is so embarrassing. Remember, you can always become a careers officer, my little punk. <laughs> well, good night. <laughs> good luck. I think I look back and think you all thought you were all incredibly encouraging and thought I was hilarious. A lot of the time we did, but there were some times when we didn't. <laughs> but I find that really encouraging for anybody out there who is... Uh... Who's doing comedy and is truly terrible. Keep yeah. going. <laughs> For 15 years, Miranda struggled to get herself noticed. She appeared in adverts and on comedy shows. I mean, to be honest, I've got a f as big as a bucket. <laughs> what? Why shouldn't I say that? Why not? Are you okay? I'm, I'm Japanese. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've shot the commander with a kind of dark. <laughs> They've shot Mr. York. They're reloading their crossbows. I'm just waiting to see what they'll do next. 
In 2009, she finally got her big break, writing and starring in her own sitcom, Miranda. Oh. No, I'm stuck. I'm almost... I'm to... It's become one of the most successful shows on television. Oh, it's mortifying. I wish the ground could have swallowed me up. <laughs> I don't think I've ever felt more beautiful. Really? The man who inspired Miranda to become a comedian was Eric Morecambe. You done it again! <laughs> Morecambe and Wise were regarded by many as the greatest comedy double act ever. This boy knows nothing. <laughs> who are you talking to? Nobody. At their height, over half the British population watched their shows. I'm playing all the right notes, <laughs> but not necessarily in the right order. I remember first seeing Morecambe and Wise, and I think I was about six or seven, and I remember being in my parents' sitting room and Eric looking down the lens and doing one of those very long looks that he did. It's all beginning to make sense. <laughs> he sort of moved to adjust the camera and then just smiled and just stared, and it felt like forever. And I just thought, I love that guy. I want... He's just looking at me. We got nothing to look masculine and beautiful. I wanted to sort of jump in the television and muck about with them. Miranda's journey into comedy wasn't an easy one. But throughout the difficult times, Eric remained her touchstone. My 20s weren't the easiest of times. I wasn't a party animal then at all, and I just kind of kept myself to myself. I was just very shy and awkward. I just slightly retreated into my world. I'm sure we've all been there. I just sort of got a bit like, what am I going to do? Because my dream's never going to happen. I'm never going to get comedy. Why should I get into comedy? <laughs> I watched them merely for escapism and joy, and they got me through many a dark hour, to which I'm forever grateful. Miranda's been a lifelong fan of Eric's comedy. Now, she wants to know more about the man behind it. There is a sort of facade to him, which I think is key to his, his comedy. And so I suppose I want to find out more about him as a person, you know, to play in rooms that he's been in and to meet people that he's met and to understand him better. Miranda's beginning her journey in Eric's birthplace in Lancashire. Eric Morecambe's real name was John Eric Bartholomew. He was brought up in a working-class home in the town that inspired his stage name, Morecambe. No, it's not a showbiz town. It's uh, a beautiful one. And there's a sort of peace about it, I think. But, yeah, I I'd love to know sort of when Eric started dreaming about bright lights and showbiz and whether that was in him from a very, very early age. It's always interesting seeing where people started in their life. In the street where Eric was born in 1926, Miranda's meeting his biographer, William Cook. So, so this is the house, and I'm surprised there's no plaque or anything. But... Yes. I wonder if the people living there know this is where he was born. From the start, Eric's comic talent shone through. Right from when he was a toddler, he was a great little song and dance man just for the relatives and friends and stuff like that. Yeah. And the weird thing about Morecambe, I mean, it seems sort of sleepy now, and very quiet, yeah, but then it was like a second Blackpool, and it was booming. And they'd do all these talent shows along the front, and Eric would join in with the other amateurs. Just for the laugh. Yeah, and yeah. he won so often, in the end, he got banned from doing it <laughs> because it was discouraging the holidaymakers from joining in. You know, <laughs> this local so boy would come along and... Oh, to and, be Eric again. Yeah, exactly. Encouraged by his mother, Sadie, Eric soon moved on to a bigger stage, performing routines in local pubs and clubs. Do you think he enjoyed being on stage, though? At that age. His mum was 
keen for him to do it. And she said herself that if it hadn't been for her, you know, he wouldn't have got off his backside, you know. I see, was... I find that fascinating, cos I... Because I want to do it and wanted to do it and love the world, I always thought that's what everyone else would feel, you know, and he would too. Morecambe provided plenty of opportunity for a budding entertainer. It was a glamorous, bustling holiday resort filled with theatres, cinemas and dance halls. Along the front was the magnificent Winter Gardens, one of Britain's biggest variety theatres. It's beautiful. Absolutely stunning. It's kind of like somebody's just shut it up and locked it and nobody's yeah. been in for 40 years. And this is where Eric saw shows and saw Flanagan Lallan and, you know, Laurel and Hardy played here as well. And, Amazing. You know, Jewel and Warris are another inspiration. You know, yeah. this is the, the kind of Tutankhamun's tomb of it, really. You know. And you wouldn't have thought now, you know, Morecambe seems such a sort of quiet an assuming little place. You wouldn't imagine that it was full of this life and this culture and this... Yeah, well, so here's Eric on stage. Is that Eric? Yeah, well, there, there he is. <gasps> Look at that. How fabulous. He sort of looks... There's a, there is a faint whiff of awkward embarrassment, isn't mm. there? A faint whiff of what am I doing? <laughs> well, also, because he was, like, 13, 13 14. And so, then. yeah, he's such a... Yeah. And he's, he's sort of... He's, it's got this sort of... Sort of comedy schoolboy thing, which is not probably what you wanted to be doing in front of your mates when you were no. that age, sort of licking a big fake lollipop yeah, and, yeah. And, and, and things. But I wonder thing. whether he wanted to be up there, whether he started to enjoy getting the laughs. Well, he's clearly very good. At an audition for young performers, Eric met another comic called Ernest Wiseman, and they formed a double act. They began touring in variety shows, performing alongside acrobats, singers, ventriloquists, and a host of weird and wonderful acts. The variety thing was mad, you know. Eric and Ernie, the number of animal acts they appeared with. They, uh, there was this uh, act called Volgerbein's, Volgerbein's Bears, which is like, is this German guy, and he was a variety artist, and he'd come on with a load of bears. bears. And Eric and Ernie would do this routine beforehand. Imagine the health and safety forms well, now. That's right. They would come on beforehand and they'd do this number where Ernie was trying to sing a song and Eric was eating crisps. <laughs> and whenever Ernie was trying to um, sing, sing a note, Eric would feed him a crisp or eat a crisp or whatever. And, of course, the crisps make a dreadful noise. Oh, and, and he was upstaging him. And then the bears would come on next and go crazy over all the... <laughs> crisps. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Many of Morecambe and Wise's later sketches evoked the acts and personalities they encountered in variety. <laughs> you know the Janet Webb thing with her coming on and taking a yeah. bow and no one's got a clue why she's doing it? Apparently that's a reference to George Formby and his wife Beryl and she used to come on and take a bow at the end of the show and in a way she had every right to because, you know, she, she was George Formby's sort of right-hand woman and everything. But everyone but, must have gone, who's that? Yeah, who the hell's that? <laughs> and, and, that and, and the Janet Webb thing is a reference to that. And people... But that's so brave, isn't it? Because no one's going to know, but it still made sense. Exactly. But that's a very brave comedic choice. Yeah, I'd not thought of that. To I do guess. something that, that's an in-joke, I suppose, they, yeah. And it's funny both ways. It's funny if you know and it's funny, funny if, you if you don't, don't know. I actually find it quite sort of haunting that we're in the place where he started out. Mm. And actually remembering, such an obvious thing, but remembering that he, he was just a boy. Mm. You know, cos the Eric for me is the showbiz on the telly, BBC Hallowed Years, Eric Morecambe. And you forget, we all start somewhere. Mm. And it, it was in this room and I find that quite... It's giving me a few goosebumps and shivers, actually. It's amazing. Eric and Ernie weren't content to remain on the variety circuit forever. They wanted to reach a wider audience. But their big breakthrough didn't come until 1953, 
when they were given their first solo show for radio. It was the same path that Miranda was to follow over 50 years later. You all come on and you sit here, your scripts. And you're just waiting to go on and it's so scary. And then you can see everyone looking at you as you get up to the mic. Everyone's going, what's she going to be like? And it's just terrifying. Yes, we found when they hang around. One way to stalk them, be wise and get broken. It isn't very long since we first... Veteran radio man Barry Cryer has found an old recording of Morecambe and Wise's show, You're Only Young Once. It was made when Eric and Ernie were still in their 20s. Oh, this is fun. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight, we want to talk to the young men and women of this country to help them, if we can, over their difficulties and problems. And here is Mr. Morecambe to say a few words. Thank you. Girls, do you feel run down when hit by a truck? <laughs> And girls, a word about your makeup. Have you tried the new Peter Pan makeup? Yes. Use Peter Pan before your pan peters out. I can sort of just hear that it's them, but they sound so different. And it's quite aggressive and almost uh, American. Yeah, really? Ernie's very aggressive as a straight man. They were sort of reminiscent of uh, Abbott and Costello, the Americans, who were very big uh, in films, and we saw them a lot over here, and I think... Uh, Eric and Ernie were influenced them? by them. Yeah. Wise and Morecambe present... Morecambe and Wise. <laughs> and she was only an engine driver's daughter, or she was local with no motive. They were already doing these sort of... That's sort of like a nod to the plays. Yes, later, in a way. going into a situation. But it's full of puns. Yeah. She was loco with no motive, motive and everything. They wouldn't have done puns later in their career. No, it was all. Right. I suppose the emphasis was because they were doing radio. We must do well, wordy gags. stuff. I'm pressing play again, Barry. Press play. Onwards. And bringing up the rear is the laughing jacket. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Bob. <laughs> he paused yes. before he said Monkhouse. Bob, because he realised he got a laugh. So that's Bob Monkhouse being, I suppose, one of their first guests. Yes, and being insulted and... Uh, sent up, as we used to say. That's interesting. Rather like they did later with Des O'Connor. Yeah. yeah. You have a friend on and uh, you insult them. And when you get up there, you're going to swing on that trapeze, backwards and forwards, ten times. I don't think this fellow can count up to ten. Don't be silly, of course I can. Listen, one, two, three, four, five, seven, eight, nine, ten. What do you do about six? Have my supper. It's <laughs> a terrible joke. Even, they even groaned then. I yeah, know. What do you do about six? Oh, dear. I have my supper. Put your arms around me, honey, and tell me you love me. Tell me while your lips are close to mine. You see, I could just, this, I just, that's that. I mean, that's them, isn't it? They, yes. They sound different. But for no reason, they do a song because that's song. what you did. You're like a miniature variety bill. We've, yeah. we've done the sketch or something, and now we'll sing a song. And now we do sing it. Not a comedy song or anything. No. We will now sing a song. Fascinating. I think I might bring that back. Then it's less, less yes, pressure. Yes. <laughs> Squeeze me just a little. Tease. It's extraordinary to think that in 1953 they were doing that radio show. They'd just been together already for many, many years, but yet they were way off still their best and what we remember as their iconic moments and their true double act and their television famous sketches and routines. But gosh, the amount of work that goes into getting comedy right. What was going on behind the scenes during those early years? In the BBC archives, Miranda uncovers a trail of correspondence that shows the extent of Eric and Ernie's struggle to get to the top. When this is 1950, do you think you could arrange to give us an audition? We know you are always looking for comedians, so how about giving us a chance to show our ability? Thanking you, Morecambe and Wise. I'm just slightly cringing back at the letters I wrote. And I remember writing to all the producers at the BBC, not realising that they all live, you know, on the same corridor at Television Centre, so they all would have seen the same package arriving. So embarrassing. Would you consider giving us a chance to show our ability 
Hoping to hear from you. Sincerely. They've got more professional now. They've dropped the thanking you. Maybe they thought that was the problem. Uh, Morecambe and Wise. Oh, what's on the back? Oh, this would have been the reply. Regret not at the moment. No opportunity of offering. But would appreciate seeing act next time they play in or near London. See, I know that response. That's just really... They're not interested. That's a kind way of saying no. Can you please leave me alone? Even the geniuses that were more and wise have to had to do the pain and embarrassment that was this. What Eric and Ernie wanted more than anything was their own TV show. Variety audiences were dwindling, and with a new wife, Joan, and a young daughter to support, Eric needed a new source of income. Eventually, Morecambe and Wise did get their longed-for break. Their TV series, Running Wild, hit the nation's screens in 1954. But it was a ratings disaster. Tonight's show was a little better underlined, but it still has a very long way to go to be a good show. Oh, would they have heard this? Audience research department. I bet they would never have seen this. I know that I'm certainly not allowed to see things like this. Um, thank goodness. How awful. The pressure. Huge pressure. Gosh. Ladies and gentlemen, Morecambe and Wise. In an interview nearly 20 years later, the critics' words were still fresh in Eric and Ernie's minds. Poor old Alma Colgan, she was with us in that show. It says, Alma Colgan stands out like a rose in the, in the garden, garden of wheats. <laughs> the other one was, get them off. off. Yeah. <laughs> but what, I mean, what was the reason for this? Oh, very simple. What? It was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Our career, we said, is in ruins. Mm. We didn't even have a career then. <laughs> After such public humiliation, many comics would have given up. But not Eric and Ernie. They began a punishing routine of stage shows, guest spots and promotional work, grasping every opportunity to put themselves in the public eye. Then, in 1961, television gave them a second chance. Well, first of all, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to speak to you about Einstein's theory of uh, astrophysics. This, of course... Is After a faltering start, Two of a Kind built a loyal audience on ITV and ran for six series. <laughs> Miranda's keen to find out more about life behind the scenes with Eric and Ernie. In the West London Church Hall, where she rehearses for her sitcom, she's arranged to meet Morecambe and Wise's co-star, Anne Hamilton. You called, monsieur? What? Hello. Oh, hello, how do you oh, do? Oh, lovely to meet you. It's a great privilege. No, 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 please, <laughs> no, no, please, me. <laughs> do you want to come through yes, to the you. rehearsal room? I do not think you will be disappointed in me. I'm looking at all the shows here. Anne Hamilton, Anne Hamilton, Anne Hamilton, that's you. You are in practically every show. No! A fine actor, that boy. I did about 100 shows with them, I think, 90. There were only one or two that I wasn't in. Anne first appeared with Eric and Ernie in a spy sketch, but things didn't go to plan. I've got your goal, love. I've got enough with him. <laughs> The review came and it said diddly 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 dee and the inevitable girl who laughed all the way through it. If Eric saw you about to go, he would work on you. He would try to make you laugh. He was wicked that way. <laughs> I got it in a plain wrapper. But would he have wanted the laughter in the final show? Would he have minded? He wouldn't have minded at all because he could capitalise on it. Yes. He could make something out of it. We'll have to get the layout of this place. Yeah, you're working yeah. well, Jeff. You're working well. It did make me feel, if ever I get the opportunity, I will never laugh again. Oh, really? Never. How interesting. And did you never laugh again? You uh, must have done. I smirked in the King Arthur sketch with Peter Cushing, but that was the last time. Eric always made people laugh, mm. wherever he was. I suppose he felt that was his mission. It's what... It was the breath of life to him, I would think. Yeah. To you, was there a very, was there a, uh, an off-stage Eric and an on-stage Eric? I have a couple of photographs that, if you're very good, I'll show you. Oh, yes, that please. That nobody else has ever seen. Wow. 
they arrived with a bunch of other photographs in the rehearsal room, and Eric and Ernie went, I don't like that, I don't like that. What, they took one look at this and said... They were going to tear them up. Why? Because they didn't like themselves so serious. That's not how they wanted the world to perceive them. That is the offstage Eric. The light, you know, the showbiz light isn't on there. Comedy is a very serious business, yeah. to quote whoever said it first of all. Yeah. It is serious. It is hard work. It yeah. doesn't come easily. And did they work incredibly? Were they very focused? Yes. Rehearsal yeah, rehearsal <clears throat> was work. Yeah. Uh, you pitched up on time, you knew, knew your lines, you hit your marks, yeah. you had a good time and you went home. Yeah. And if you didn't fit in with that professionalism, you weren't asked back. Right. Interesting. I might often say, when we're well ahead on a strip, now let's have tomorrow off. And they have said to me frequently, now we'll go ahead, we'll try the words tomorrow. You, you have tomorrow off if you like, but we'll come in, you see. Now this is terribly encouraging, I mean, and obviously if, with people like Morecambe and Wise, one wants to work harder and harder. When Morecambe and Wise moved from ITV to the BBC, the scale and ambition of the show grew and grew. It was very special. Yeah. It was the show to be on. When you think that Christmas Day, more than 28 million people watched yeah. it. And it's it's really just mind-boggling, isn't yeah. it? Including the royal family. They were the prize possession of the BBC at that time. And it was the golden age. The energy of Eric's performances belied the fact that his health was fragile. Even a heart attack at the age of only 42 failed to slow him down. Let's face the music and dance. There was never any hint that he had ever been poorly, that he was poorly, that he was going to go on being poorly. Nothing. Just carried on. Ooh. Amazing. The only thing that he said was, keep going, you fool, when he came back on yeah, stay on to the show after his heart attack. Thank you very much. Keep going, you fool. <laughs> <laughs> Miranda has tried to bring a touch of the same playfulness and joy, so evident in the shows of the late 70s, into her own work 40 years later. Oh, you disgust me. The looks to camera, of course, I got from him, and I wanted to do a show where I kind of honoured the tradition and his tradition. You know, the dressing up and the brightness and the silliness, yet to be in a sitcom. I'm so sorry. I thought that Just you... Just get up, yeah. please. <laughs> With fame came the chance for Eric to indulge some of his other passions and escape the pressure of showbiz. He'd been an avid football fan since childhood and in 1970 became a director at Luton Town Football Club. Miranda's come to the club's home ground at Kenilworth Road. Jazz hands finished. For fans like myself, when I used to come here in those days when he was a director, yeah. Just to be in the crowd and suddenly see him see. come into his seat. It was Where would such sit? Where a would buzz. He sit? Sort of up there ish, and the director's box wow. is up there. But of course, he actually came as a, an ordinary fan, first of all, because yeah. he lived six miles away in Harpenden, and that's how it all started. It must have been a lovely escape from him, away from yeah. the pressures of telly, you mm. know, just to yeah. be with the lads. I remember um, sometimes if we weren't playing very well, the fans would shout, What do you think of it so far? And he'd shout, Rubbish! You know. This that's is at the game, genius. you know, the fans here would look back at him up there. Oh, that's <clears> so <throat> nice. <laughs> if there was an opportunity to promote his beloved club, Eric would take it. Now, that's what I call a result. <laughs> Arsenal! <laughs> My queen, the Roman guard, is here.
not that I'm focused entirely on number six, I am. sense of his presence. You can just see him in the stands with his pipe, you know. And got lots of little girls and boys with their glasses. Some of them going, why am I wearing these glasses, Dad? <laughs> Not understanding. But it feels like Eric Morecambe is still part of Luton Town. And it must have been so nice for him just to be watching something and the pressure be on someone else. It's a really lovely feeling. next visit takes her to the other side of the country. We are going to deepest, northest, westest Wales um, to meet Eddie Braben because he was really the sort of third member, as it were, of Morecambe and Wise. He was the and of Morecambe and Wise. I always used to see his name on the credits, and I always used to think, who is this Eddie Braben who comes up with these amazing, brilliant ideas? I'm getting a bit... I might get a bit starstruck and get a bit weird. Right. Oh, I sound a bit nervous. You finally Eddie, made it! I found you. You rascal. I found you. Found Hello. You. Lovely to see you. Oh, oh wow. thank you so much for coming all this way to oh. see a clapdown comedy writer. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for oh, it's lovely. <laughs> it's amazing to meet you. I can't believe Eddie Braben's just hugged me. You flattered me. You're very no, kind. honestly. You are very kind. It's amazing. People have said to me, What well, how did you do it? How did you make Eric and any the way they were? <laughs> and there's one word that says it all innocence. Right. There was innocence in everything they did. And I've so always true. believed in this make-believe world of Eric and Ernie. And it was why I never want them ever to go outside the studio. If you go outside, you break the spell. Yes. Outside is real. That's so interesting you say that, because I suddenly realised, I was thinking, why did they bring me so much joy and escapism? And, it, and I wrote exactly that. It was because it wasn't reflecting anything about my life. No. It was a cocoon of joy, a completely other world. Hey! <laughs> when you were writing the Morgan Wise stuff, how did you know when it was funny? Uh, occasionally, you get an idea that is so good, mm. you know, this is gold, this yeah. is going to work. <laughs> Oggy. The ventriloquist doll, ten feet tall. Oh, yes. And I knew, give Eric a, a doll that's ten feet tall. You really didn't need dialogue. I sit on that chair. Lovely. And let him lean and right And what here, but that's it, that's made me laugh is whoever made the prop had made it look like Ken Dodd. <laughs> hey, wait a minute, he's getting a bit heavy for me. Hey, he's heavy, easy, I'm on it. <laughs> Obviously, you love laughing, you bring joy, but the, the, did, did you have to sort of take time to recover? Did, were you very sort of sapped by it? The, the real pressure came when um, I was sat in front of that typewriter with all those blank pages. Yeah. And there's a deadline and there was nothing there. Nothing was happening. That's when you realise there were 20 million, 24 million, yeah. 25 million people looking over your shoulder or saying, make me laugh. Did you ever, did you ever want to jack it all in? Was it all too much? Did you Every ever... day. Oh. Every day it was all too much. It was ridiculous because the Malcolm and Wise show became more important than Christmas. Yeah. And I thought, this isn't right. It shouldn't be like this. Well, he's got the worst job in the world, hasn't he? He's got his own little house right. with his own little office yes. and he goes in there, let's say, on a Monday morning with a typewriter and a blank sheet of paper. That's that. And then he starts from there. And 
that's it, that's the hard bit. That's what it's all about. That's where we would find it difficult. He thinks of things that we think are very funny. I like, well, I wish to go, we could think of. Mm. But we can't. My producers and my agent, tells, they tell me off, because I always say in interviews, I hate writing, I hate it. And they say, you shouldn't do that, really. Because, A, yeah. you're in a very privileged job. Yeah. Um, but I'm afraid I just can't help myself, because I do hate it so much. Oh, so do I. Right. I did exactly that. Right. Um, you can't put yourself through that, the agonies of, of producing day in, day out. And you have a standard. You have mm. to keep to that standard. Mm. And you have people waiting. Yeah. And you're aware of this. Yeah. And you don't go, ho, 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 you can't laugh at that. No. That's a fact. It's a hard fact. Yeah. It's cruel. But you kept that to yourself, though. Oh, yeah, I, I did. When you got up in the morning to write, did you feel sick and dread at the thought? Did you? Then I was smoking 40 cigarettes a day. Gosh. And the part I dreaded was going down to London, to Delgano Way, behind Wormwood Scrubs, <laughs> to this centre, community centre. Yeah. The old folks were on the ground floor singing I'll Be Your Sweetheart and cruising down the river. And we're upstairs rehearsing. And I, I'd go there with the script, three copies, one for Eric, one for Ed, and one for Johnny Hammond. Oh, morning, boys. And they'd be sitting at this trestle table, and I'd be on the chair the other side. I was like being judged. I so sat there and waited. So they'd read it out in front of you for the first time? And it'd be. Gosh. Like a... I'm thinking of a bit of phone call tonight from Johnny Hammond. Sir. Oh, hello, Eddie. Uh, the boys feel. Oh, God, I used to dread that. As soon as he said the boys feel, I knew the boys felt something wasn't working. Begins to pace the room. room. Map. Here, Prime Minister. Pulls down on a, a roller fixed to the wall, a world atlas. What's that? It's a map of the world. Good Lord. For the past six months, I've been drying my hands on that. <laughs> Mum. <Mom. laughs> so you must now look back and go, it was worth the stress. Yes, I do. I do. Although, uh, I did pay a price uh, with health. It erupted years later. Really? Yeah. Yeah. With me, it should have been say no. Mm. But I could never say no. But if Eric had said no, he probably would have... Don't know if he'd be alive now, but he certainly would have lived longer. I would think so. Yeah. I would think so, yeah. For Eric, the pressure of being Britain's funniest man was a heavy burden to carry. In rehearsals for the Christmas special of 1977, he grew increasingly tense. He worried that the show was too complex, too ambitious. In the event, the show was a triumph, watched by a record 28 million people. Nine, eight, seven, eight, five, four, three. Oh, Thank you, Adi. I'm just trying down here. I really don't like that. No, no, no. Wait. Don't worry. Can now? Can you get that leg? Yes. Down. I'll hold on to anything that. Yes. Dignity at all times. Yes. Yes, I'm sure you can. Yes. Try a little. Get this one. No, no, maybe. While she's on the road, Miranda's keen to find a little-known Morecambe and Wise icon. A huge statue of Eric and Ernie, made in 1977, was exhibited in Regent's Park. After complaints from local residents, it was taken down. Its whereabouts have been unknown for years, but now Miranda's tracked it down to a secret location. So, right, straight on, can't be that way. Where am I going now? Oh, I've just passed it! <gasps> this is quite exciting. It's a private road. Hello, we're just tipping up for tea. Um, mine's Noel Grey, and do you have a more a wise statue? We can't go any further, we're going to have to go in. This is really embarrassing. <laughs> Here we are. Come on, Pegs. Here we are at someone's house. Snoop about. 
Okay, well, if I had a more Wise statue, personally, I would put it here. I should point out I didn't train Peggy to be a sniffer statue dog, which I really should have done at this point. Oh, I've just seen it! Oh, it's massive! Oh, extraordinary! How did we get there? But you see, I was think I was about to diss them for not being proper Morecambe and Wise fans because I was thinking they've got it miles away. But I didn't think they put it right outside their house. I mean, that's quite extreme. Right, I've got to find it. Oh, there it is! It's huge and really bright blue. Look at that! For once, I feel petite. Okay, now let's let's be honest about this because I'm a big Walk and Wise fan, as you know. Part of me does understand why Regent's Park <laughs> would not have been that happy with it. it. It's it's a thing of beauty to me because it's them, but it's not the greatest thing of beauty, is it? As a piece of art. Also, if we're really honest. If you were walking past that, you would wonder if that was Eric Morgan. <laughs> I'm just keeping it real here, and I couldn't be more excited to have met it. But if we just have a look at his face, that could be Leslie Crowther and a number of other people. It's what I call arresting. Thank you. Make me happy through the year. <coughs> Never bring me back. By the late 70s, Eric had spent 40 years as one half of a double act. Yes, fine. Yes. And although he wasn't about to abandon Morecambe and Wise, he was beginning to get bored. Looking for new challenges, he began to accept solo projects. He took small cameo roles in short films. He also agreed to appear in a rarely seen documentary. He was asked to sit for a portrait by the little known artist Richard Stone. And what about that arm? If you could sort of push the it. The process was filmed okay. from start to finish. And you want me to sit like this for seven weeks? D does the idea of a portrait um, worry you in any way? Of actually uh, sitting before Not an in the original thought, it didn't. It, it's getting more worrying now. When anyway. I can't paint you. I'm going to ask you to do something with your hair. Could you just do that? Go to the hairdresser? No. The now it's Miranda's turn. No. no. You're that, doing that? That's, yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yes. Just, that, that's perfect now. Just leave it. She's come to sit for Richard in his studio in Essex. Have you been painted before? Never. Never? No. Are you nervous about this? Not in the slightest, should I be? Right, now let's get on with the sitting, shall we? Ready when you are, Polly. Ha! Ah. You starstruck when you met him? Of course. Yeah. I mean, he was just, you know, a, a figure that dominated Christmas. I mean, yeah. it was the Queen's Speech and it was the Morecambe and Wise show. Well, it must um, have been very nerve-wracking. Well, well, it was, even though Eric was unbelievably kind, saying, look, this is a programme about yeah. you. You tell me what you want me to do and I will do it. Are you happy? Yes, I'm That's the most happy. important thing. Do you want me to lie down? I'd much rather you stand. Yes, all right, then. If you had to sum up Eric Morecambe. <laughs> Inevitably funny and genuinely caring. Caring? Yes. There would always be a collection of people that would gather around his Rolls Royce, which would be parked outside. And he would go out and he would greet people. And there would be someone he would identify to have a brief chat with. He didn't need to do that. It could so easily have been, you know, hi everyone, and a couple of autographs in the car and away. But he, he wasn't like that. Before he left you and went out to his car and knew there'd be people out there, did he ever say, take a deep breath and go, right, here we go? No. Because there's a couple of times when I've just been a bit shy or tired and someone's come up to me and I've sort of moved off quickly or just haven't been... I've never been rude. And I feel incredibly guilty about that. Do you think he liked being famous? I don't know what he liked. I think he just accepted that this was, you know, part of the package. Was Eric Morecambe ever silent when he sat for you? Did he ever just sit? 
Um, yes, he was quite capable of just sitting, sort of enjoying that moment where he wasn't being socially coerced into a polite conversation. There is another side that the public wouldn't necessarily have seen, that sort of quieter, more reflective man. What would you have asked Eric? There you are, you're meeting at a little sort of cafe in Harpenden. Oh, what a fabulous notion, yeah. And? Why do you do your job? Is it worth it? Is it worth it all? It would be a vital question to ask him because I suppose it's an interesting point at where I'm at in that it's a dream, it's been my dream all my life and I still get fanatical meeting people and I love the sort of, you know, showbiz and the lights going down and all the excitement of it and I love hearing a laugh. But not all of it is fun. During the sittings, Richard became aware of Eric's continuing health problems. He puts his hand up to his heart to not make a joke about it, but there was the message was there that, you know, this is actually quite testing. It's a long way, isn't it? Yes, it is. We're on the third floor here. Yeah, I had noticed. Quite how conscious I was of trying to reveal something of the anxiety behind the public face. Mm. Um, I don't know, but several people looking at the portrait see definitely another side to Eric there. That's great. You're pleased, aren't you? I think so. When the portrait was finally revealed at a celebrity party, Eric the Entertainer was back. We'd had the portrait done, and so Eric was then being um, the, the Eric that we all, all recognised, or at least publicly recognised. Oh, listen! That's better, that's the Come on. They are, they are right, obviously. I feel a bit nervous. I don't like looking in a mirror, let alone in pictures, so this will be quite interesting. But let's... Yes, and of course you can't even comment on the frame, because it's not even framed no yet. Fr lovely. Oh, gosh. We're sort of, we're almost there. Wow. Obviously. Wow, you are clever. It's quite strange looking at yourself. Even though I look at myself on the telly, that sort of one removed, this is... I look very sad, don't you think? Well, perhaps this is what we've been talking about with Eric's portrait, yeah. is... It is the, the person behind the, the comic mask. But it's, it's clearly me. Well, it's your hair. Which yeah, is well, very you've made distinctive. my hair look better than it is. Do you know my one problem with it? What is that? It, you think I've got a moustache. <laughs> it's a trick of the light. That looks like a moustache. It's a trick of the light. It's shadow. I would like to point <laughs> out I do not have hair there. <laughs> but Richard Stone a... clearly thinks I do. <laughs> In March of 1979, Eric had a second heart attack. How are you feeling? Great. <laughs> Absolutely <laughs> marvellous. You've obviously got to take it easy for a bit, though, presumably. Well, if I can get a bit, I'll take it easy, yes. <laughs> <laughs> you must have rehearsed that one. No, I didn't. No, no, I didn't know you were going to say it, did I? No. You're going to rest. I've got to rest. Weeks. For a couple of weeks, is it? Several. Several. But In public, he made light of his condition, but privately, he faced a grim truth. Heart bypass surgery was now the only way to prolong his life. Intensive care unit, please. <laughs> See ya. Bye-bye. With surgery scheduled for May, Eric retreated to the country for a few days to stay with a friend, the sports presenter, Dickie Davis. He came to stay with us before the big operation. Right. He really was very ill at that point. Yeah. And he was, he was worried. Well, there's no question about it, he was worried. Not many of... Heart bypasses had actually occurred by yeah, that time, no, I it suppose. Must have been very scary. Uh, I used to stay up talking with them until about two or three in the morning. Gosh. Except on a Friday. And uh, I said to them at three o'clock in the morning, I said, Look, I've got to go up to the studio and do a programme tomorrow <laughs> or today. Yes, in three <laughs> so hours. I, he said, Oh, so it's me and the Valiant, was it? I said, Yes, I'm afraid it is. 
Good afternoon and a very warm welcome to World of Sport. And the two men had been friends for years. Eric had even made a memorable appearance on World of Sport two years earlier. So it's much real. So that with just two legs to the play. The last time I saw anything like the oh. top lip, the whole herd had to be destroyed. <laughs> 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 it's real. After his heart bypass, Eric was keen to get back into action. Was there a fear of sort of never working again? <laughs> well. After he was re recovering, he couldn't wait to get back. And I said, why in such a hurry? I said, you love writing. Oh. And I said, why don't you get a dad and you'll just, you know, give yourself a chance. But he couldn't. He was a, it was a drug. He had to get back. Was it? Do you think it really oh, was Oh, yeah, no question about it. Come here. Eric had been performing since he could remember and professionally since he was 14. Maybe just the thought of retiring. I mean, to have that all your life, it must have been really terrifying, probably, the thought of stopping. Because what do you fill it with, you know? What are you when you stop if you've been working for 50 years? Mm. While rehearsing for the 1983 Christmas show, Eric had another heart scare. You're waiting for your Christmas present, aren't you? If you want. Well, I've got one for you. Yeah, it's a special one. It's not a stretcher, is it? <laughs> oh. Frightened that worse was to follow, do ambulance men will do. Eric agreed to further hospital tests and began at last to plan for his retirement. But first, he wanted to fulfil a long-standing promise. He'd agreed to do a show with an old friend from Variety Days, Stan Stennett. Miranda's come to Blynavon in South Wales to meet Stan. Stan Stennett as Billy with Bonzo in the spectacular pantomime Robin Hood. <laughs> oh, look. Hello, Stan. Hello. Hello, it's Miranda. Shumai. Hello, can I come up and... Miranda, by all means, do. Oh, how Welcome lovely to Welcome to Welsh meet Wales. You. Thank you, what a lovely place this is. Are you rehearsing now, then? Yeah. Pantomime's brilliant because it's often the first time kids see... It is. It's, well, we always said that in, in the yes. days of... I started way back in 1949. Um, uh, can we, I uh, ask you all about it? Can we sit somewhere backstage or something? And yeah. I, I can quiz you. Come this way with me. Walk this way. I'm walking this way. I'm following you. You, you should say <laughs> if I could walk that way, I wouldn't need the talcum powder. <laughs> but that's the joke. <laughs> Through here. I'm following you, doing your walk. Lovely. Come on, Miranda. Through here. My goodness <laughs> me. Eric and Ernie, we met in uh, 53, 1953. And we were together for quite a few years. Wow. So we became great friends. The last night Eric and I were together was in the theatre I used to run in Tewkesbury. Yeah. Called the Roses Theatre. Yeah. And uh, he'd wanted to come down for a long time and do a show with me. The first half of the show was the variety. The second half was Eric and I. We were really doing a sort of a, a Parkinson-type yeah. interview. We did a little thing called um, the, the, the Entertainer. Yes. We played down on stage. And Eric came round while she were all playing. I was playing guitar. And, uh, and Eric just went around and did a little bit on each oh, of the instruments. It sounded uh, like he, from what I've read, that he was just absolutely on fire that night. That he oh, was he just... was. He, he was like a man possessed. He seemed to sense something was going to happen that night. And you can see on some of them, he was quite pensive in his... Uh, yeah, he looked sort of yeah. quite removed. He looked there. a little bit away from it all, you see. As the show ended, Eric left the stage to rapturous applause. My stage manager came on stage and said, uh, excuse me, Sam, Eric's collapsed. Gosh. And I saw everything stopped, you see. He was in the wings when he collapsed. And he had a heart attack. And they got him off to the hospital in Cheltenham, you know. Eric died in hospital a few hours later. He was 58. Miranda's journey ends at the place where Eric's star shone brightest. For her, Eric and Ernie Live 
recorded here in Croydon's Fairfield Halls, is Morecambe and Wise's finest performance. Wow. Applause took them here. Sort of spring in step. Have we got time for any more? Yeah, I think so. I think oh, that lovely. Eric and Ernie Live filmed on this very stage was them at their very best. I don't think they've ever done anything better for me. Hey! <laughs> the joy of being a comedian, I think you can see, the joy of getting laughs. And it's just Eric soaring, I think, at his absolute best. Hey. Where were you? I was halfway through. There's a brilliant aside he does. Right. Everybody? Doing? Nothing, nothing. <laughs> Must be imagination. Yes. <laughs> it wasn't. Oh, it's obviously my imagination. It wasn't. <laughs> it was just brilliant, and that got a huge laugh, and I think that's probably where I got the inspiration for that um, kind of to camera thing of yes, no. Two, three, four. It just makes me so happy watching them. Dance, particularly Eric, it was a brilliant mover. I spent a lot of time in my twenties playing and then rewinding the video, and then playing and learning, <laughs> learning the routine. So I'd be going, okay, he's on his right foot there, and I'd really learn the whole routine. Get off. That was my favourite bit ever, I thought. One day I want to be on stage and have that kind of joy and confidence of kind of just looking at the audience and just going off and going, yeah, I'm loving this, you're loving this. It's all worked out. I'm in comedy and I've given you joy. Thank you. It's an important job to do, I think, comedy. Not exactly saving lives, but the thing is, life is tough, isn't it? Life's really tough for so many people. And as the song goes, in this world where we live, there should be more happiness. And there should, so... You know, he, he really did give me more happiness. I have to say it like that. And um, it's quite arresting and quite overwhelming that I might do that to other people. And thanks to him, you know. Thank you, Eric. Do, 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 do. But with good, strong, positive thinking, good, strong, positive thinking, good, strong, positive drinking, eh? We'll get together and life won't let us die.